Good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Empowering Students with Primary Sources, which is sponsored by ProQuest, part of Clarivate. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Um, I'll put some links in the chat to where you can register for upcoming CHOICE ACRL webinars and watch previous webinar recordings. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are, we are ready to get started, so I will hand it over to Jody. Thank you, Sabrina, and welcome to this informative webinar focused on student engagement with primary sources. I'm Jody Johnson, a product marketer with Clarivate, and I have the privilege of being joined by an incredible panel who will navigate us through today's presentation. We have with us today, Professor Rebecca Jo Plant, historian and professor at University of California, San Diego. She is also editor of the online database, Women in Social Movements in the United States from 1600 to 2000. Rebecca's most recent book co-authored with France M. Clark from University of Sydney is Of Age, Boy Soldiers and Military Power in the Civil War Era. It was published just this year. Next is student researcher Kayla Regas, also from University of California, San Diego. She is going to share her firsthand insights into the educational impact of primary sources drawn from her own experience in Professor Plant's course. And lastly, we have Samantha Lebrano, the product manager for the Women in Social Movements collection for also anthropology and religion, part of ProQuest Clarivate. Throughout our presentation, we're going to delve into the real world work that's being done with archival materials. We'll show practical strategies for effectively integrating primary sources into teaching and learning, and we'll be emphasizing the role of inspiring students and promoting critical thinking. Throughout today's presentation, we invite you to share your questions in the Q&A. We will address as many as we can as time allows at the end of the session. But our focus today will be on understanding how primary sources can be a dynamic tool to ignite curiosity, encourage active learning, and to connect students with the past. So on that note, I would like to give the lead to Samantha Lebrano to explain. Wonderful. Thank you, Jody, for that introduction and welcome everyone to this engaging webinar. As Jody mentioned, I'm Samantha Lubrano, the product manager for the Women in Social Movements Anthropology and Religion Portfolio at ProQuest. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Let's start by diving in into the impactful work we do at ProQuest to preserve voices in women's studies. Professor Rebecca Plant and student researcher Kayla Regas will further illustrate how these efforts bridge the gap between theory and practice. The work that Professor Plant and Kayla will present today is preserved in the Women in Social Movements Library. These collections are crucial resources that enrich historical research, shedding light on the complex history of women's public activism globally through the voices of women who play pivotal roles in shaping it. This slide shows how the different collections that are, that are represented in the Women in Social Movements. The library will also be included in ProQuest Women in Gender Studies, ProQuest Women and Gender Studies unifies over five centuries of authoritative content for researchers of all levels to explore themes in women's gender and men's masculinity studies. Now let's explore what makes the online collection that houses Professor Plant and Kayla's work truly special. Women and Social Movements in the United States 1600 to 2000 was originally created in 1997 by founding editors Thomas Dublin and Kathleen Skylar. 
to introduce students to the process of discovering, editing, and analyzing historical documents related to women and social movements in US history. One of the goals of this database is to advance scholarly debates and understanding of US women's history while also making those insights accessible to teachers and students at various institutes. Both a database and an electronic journal, Women and Social Movements in the US is published biannually with new editions appearing in the fall and spring. Each edition typically includes two new teaching resources created by faculty called document projects. These are substantial peer reviewed publications that include curated primary sources accompanied by an introductory article, as well as books, images, essays, book reviews, teaching tools, and so much more. These document projects now number, numbering over 140 cover an impressive array of topics ranging from Illinois Indian women who converted to Catholicism in the 17th and 18th centuries to Northern abolitionist women who moved to Kansas in hopes of banning slavery in that future state to the transnational campaign in the early 1970s to liberate Angela Davis. Okay, I think that's enough for me. Uh, I am now happy to introduce the current editor for Women in Social Movements in the US, Professor Rebecca Plant, who took over as editor in 2019. She has helped to bring new features to the collection, including round table and multimedia content for a more immersive learning and research experience. Under Professor Plant and her co-editor at the time, Judy Wu, the Empire Suffrage Syllabus, a collaborative effort with other faculty and researchers, which is freely available in the database, was created. And today we are fortunate enough to have Professor Plant and her student Kayla with us to shed light on their newest document project, Do Not Toss the Letter Away. Women's Hardship Petitions in the U.S. Federal Government During the Civil War. With that, I invite Professor Plant to take it away. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm really, really happy to be here today and to get to speak about this collaboration um, and why I think document projects are such a valuable teaching tool. So Kayla's going to give you her version of how it is we came to work together but I wanna start off by saying that um, I've never co-authored something with an undergraduate student before. And um, so this was a whole new experience for me. So I'd earlier co-authored something with a former honors student, but that was after we had gotten to know each other and he had gone off to graduate school to pursue an MA. So with Kayla, <laughs> neither of us really knew what we were getting into. So she'd taken my class on the US Civil War, uh, but that was a large lecture class. Um, and it enrolled probably over a hundred, well, it did enroll over a hundred students. So I'd not gotten to know her well, which unfortunately really is quite the norm for many of us who teach at large R1 institutions. And at the end of the quarter, uh, Kayla came up, she approached me, said she'd like to work together. And initially, I didn't really know what to say, um, but I, I didn't like the idea of turning away a student who seemed eager to delve deeply into historical research. So I tried to rack my brain and come up with an idea. And as it turns out, it really wasn't very hard. Uh, I have a co-author who, um, Frances Clark at the University of Sydney. And she and I have been for quite a long time sitting on this amazing set of primary sources. So these are petitions from the records of the Adjutant General's office. They are housed in the DC branch of the National Archives. And uh, what they are during the Civil War, all the letters from family members of soldiers serving in the Union Army, they, they ended up being funneled into this office. And it's an enormous collection, something like a thousand boxes with, you know, a hundred or between a hundred and three hundred individual petitions per box. Um, and it really represents something quite remarkable. It represents uh, a huge number of Americans really for the first time turning to the federal government for practical concrete assistance. And in the process of doing so, really detailing their daily life struggles. So it was Francis who first sort of discovered what a gold mine this collection was. She took notes and photographed um, uh, hundreds of hardship petitions, 
mainly from soldiers, wives, and mothers. But she eventually came to me with a particular subset of these sources. These were letters from parents who were trying to get their underage boys discharged from the Union Army. And long story short, Francis and I ended up being so fascinated by the sheer volume of these petitions and the difficulty the parents had actually getting the boys out, um, even boys as young as 13 and 14, that we ended up writing an entire book on that particular topic, the book that um, uh, Jody mentioned, of age, boy soldiers and military power in the Civil War era. So we made extensive use of those petitions, but all the while the letters that um, Francis had initially collected were sitting unused in our Dropbox. So those were the documents that came to mind when Kayla approached me. And I knew that these sources would make a great document project for teaching about Northern women's experiences simply because I was already familiar with the so other sources that are out there. Um, most of us who teach on this topic, either from a US women's history perspective or from a civil war perspective, um, we tend to focus on the extraordinary women whose names you will probably recognize. So in my lectures, for example, I discuss um, women like Clara Barton, um, who in addition to serving as a nurse, um, she founded an office devoted to helping families locate missing soldiers. Uh, Dorothea Dix, who was superintendent of army nurses and Harriet Tubman, who among many other things helped to lead the remarkable Combahee River raid. So I also discuss, you know, women who acted as spies, women who disguised themselves to go fight, um, and women who raised huge amounts of money for the Northern War effort um, through the US Sanitary Commission. And among readings that I've assigned are things like the diary and letters of Hannah Ropes, um, a nurse, Louisa May Alcott's hospital sketches, and Harriet Jacobs' life among the contrabands. And all of these are really remarkable sources that certainly uh, deserve to be taught, yet none of them actually really capture the experiences of ordinary women. So these were women who, you know, had to be at home uh, trying to keep the, the family unit functioning. So they weren't off doing these really quite, you know, they weren't leaving the so-called woman's sphere. Um, so the letters that we collected, they provide really a very different and in truth, a much more representative perspective on women's wartime experiences, which is what Kayla now is going to detail. Hi, thanks so much for that intro, Professor Plant. Uh, my name is Kayla and um, I am an undergraduate transfer at UCSC and we recently published this summer this document project, uh, Do Not Toss This Letter Away. Um, and what that really means that we published a document project is that um, we read through hundreds of those petitions that Professor Plant was talking about. Um, and we looked for letters that sort of exemplified the hardships that Northern women faced during the Civil War. Um, so we selected 26 women whose letters um, made an example of what the Northern woman was going through at this time. Uh, and we transcribed their letters character by character. Um, we researched these authors' backgrounds and wrote brief summaries of them, um, who these women were, where they lived, um, their socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, and we published these so that educators and academics and students could have access to these women's stories and to hear their voices. But we're here today to present uh, not only on these set of primary sources in particular, but also on the significance of, of primary sources in general um, in the world of teaching and learning. You know, why would we why would we create a document project and, and why should uh, professors and students be using these document projects? And I think that 
the best way for me as a non-historian uh, to explain this is um, just to explain how I personally wound up being so invested in this set of 26 uh, primary sources. Um, I actually entered UCSD as a psychology major and I'm still a psychology major. I had only taken one history course uh, before at community college, and that was a general history of the United States. Um, and really, I wasn't I wasn't sold on the idea of taking another history course. Uh, history was never my favorite subject. And I remember thinking in elementary school that what we called social studies uh, was my least favorite subject. And, you know, I thought I didn't have much interest in things that seemed like they happened a really, really long time ago. You know, the little details about the military battles, um, when they took place and where, and political campaigns and what speeches were made. Um, that all seemed very difficult for me to imagine. It was too far in the past for me. And so I couldn't really imagine the significance of those historical details to my life. But uh, Professor Plant was teaching this Civil War course. Um, and I lucked out to where it satisfied two of my general education requirements at the same time. And I thought, you know, I always liked war stories as they were told in fiction, uh, the Tim O'Briens and Joseph Hellers. So I decided to give uh, war history a shot. And um, it was a wonderful course. I, I loved Professor Plant's lectures and the readings that she assigned. And I realized that I did, I did like history when it was taught in a certain way. And um, as she mentioned, I had to approach her after the class was over uh, because she had said she worked on these side projects and my curiosity got the best of me. I told her that I'd want to be involved. And um, I, I didn't realize at the time exactly what I was getting myself into, how many hours I would pour over these letters. Um, but Professor Plant initially just sent me a really, really long document of all of these uh, loosely transcribed letters and petitions from the Civil War era that came out of those National Archives. And it was when I started reading these letters that I really began to fall in love with history. I remember I was sitting in the airport uh, waiting to catch a flight home, uh, and I was reading these letters one after another. Uh, and that was the most fun I'd ever had at the airport uh, because it was like I was communicating in some way with these real people from the 1860s, just looking at my, you know, my 20th century, 21st century laptop. And so um, this is one of the first letters that I read, um, a letter by a soldier named William Davies, who basically claims to the federal government, he says, hey, I, I got blackout drunk one night and woke up to discover that I had enlisted myself in the army. So these kinds of letters, um, you know, I could sympathize with this young author and I also got, personally got a kick out of it. Um, and I also read letters that were written by a woman during this time. Uh, this is a letter by Mary J. Austin. And this letter actually ended up in being selected for our document project. Um, she was a mother of two young children, three years old and eight months old. And Mary in this letter said that she had been thrown into consumption and that she was worried about who would take care of her children if she had died because her husband had recently enlisted as a U.S. sharpshooter, I think four months prior to her writing this letter. Uh, so her husband was away at war. And reading this kind of letter um, for the first time, you know, I couldn't help but put myself in Mary's shoes. You know, I'd have to imagine, okay, I'm a few years older than I am now. Um, maybe I've just had a couple of kids. 
uh, my husband's gone away to a war um, and now I've fallen sick. Of course, I would be completely worried about what would happen to my family if I didn't make it through this. Um, now, I learned about the Civil War before, uh, even before my class with Professor Plant. I remember in elementary school uh, learning about this guy named Robert E. Lee who fought for my home state of Virginia. And I had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. But these letters were so different than anything I learned before. Um, you know, there were these secondary source analyses of maybe what happened at Bull Run. And there were these primary source political speeches that were very famous, very polished. Um, and those kinds of sources, they had all these big words and references to a past that I didn't really understand. Um, but reading these, these petitions written by people during the Civil War, that was different because it's these real relatable people just explaining in simple terms uh, what was going on during their lives at that time. So to illustrate um, just how personal and authentic and even entertaining uh, these letters can be, I've put together a few examples. So this is one of our authors, Pamela Gould. She is writing, she's petitioning um, a request for her husband to be discharged. She wrote, I implore you, do write to me and say you will, and you shall have the best thanks and prayers from me, a poor, sick, friendless, abused, wretched woman and child, I might say. Do, oh, do send relief to me, a poor, lone sufferer. So of course, her desperation just bleeds through the page. Um, you can tell through her language just how helpless she felt at that time when she was put in that circumstance because of the war. Here's another example from Frances Utter. She's also hoping to get her husband released. Um, and she is very, very angry when she writes this letter. Uh, she says, to the one, the one that has authority to release my husband, be it governor or secretary or president, I care not who, all the fire of my indignation is aroused and I must express myself. But what language shall I find appropriate? What words, oh, the agony of my soul at this time is beyond the power of words. So of course you can even feel Frances's anger in reading this, she's so angry that her husband has been taken away from her. But this is uh, my favorite quote, I think, of all the letters. And this is uh, Mary Spinks, who believes that her husband is alive. She hasn't heard from him in a while, but uh, his, his notice of death never made it to her. So she writes a letter to her husband, um, at basically asking where he is and sharing some of the neighborhood gossip with him. And she's very bitter and sarcastic. So Mary says to her husband, I heard that Mrs. Mastic got a letter from you last March. I saw her and she denied knowing anything about you. I believe that she lied, and it is my candid opinion that if such people get to heaven, hell need not to have been made. So, of course, um, these people's lives were completely different from mine. Um, they were in a different world in terms of literacy and gender norms and politics and technology. But in these letters, the authors convey their experiences so directly um, that as the reader, I never felt like there was any irreconcilable different distance between us. And that really gave life to my understanding of history that put the Civil War in perspective. Um, no longer was the Civil War a series of events, you know, marches, battles, proclamations, the Civil War instead became 
this giant context where women like these, women that I got got to know through their personal letters, um, this is the context where they actually sat down in their chair and wrote a letter to the government. And um, let me use the example of Mary Blount to illustrate how much a single primary source can shape our perspectives of, uh, of history. And this is one of my favorite cases, the case of Mary Blount, because she gives so much detail to the hardships that she faced during the Civil War. So Mary was 28 when her husband was forced to enlist in 1864, and she was left uh, to take care of four young children at her home in Indiana. And so she explained her circumstances in a letter to the federal government. She said, my house is not fit for to winter in, and I am not able to fix it, as I am almost run down. And I really think that I see the hardest times of any woman that is left. I have already frozen my feet so that I can hardly wear my shoes. My feet is all to haul about one and a half mile. And tomorrow I will have to go and haul some corn to feed with. So of course she's talking about how tough that Indiana winter is going to be. Um, she also explains her, her husband's poor health. She was worried that her husband would die of illness at war. And he actually did pass away only months um, after she sent this letter. She also talks about um, her frustrations with the draft. Um, at this time, rich men who were drafted could hire a substitute so that they wouldn't have to go to war, but the poor folks couldn't afford um, to hire a substitute so they would get sent off. So Mary Blount says, there was stout men enough in the principal to fill the call if they would have taken them, but the rich men could get off for their money and the poor men had to fill their places, whether fit or not fit. So we learned so much about history from this short letter, you know, about the draft and its inconsistencies, about how poor folks fared in the Midwest, about uh, gender roles and motherhood. Uh, but really on top of all that, with these super personal letters, is um, the benefit of being able to imagine all of these things interacting with each other in a tangible context. So how how the draft interacted with you know rural Indiana and how that interacted with uh, a woman's role as a mother. And so we can see how all these things come together, um, how the Civil War affected one woman's life. So this is really what I mean when I say that primary source documents can bring history to life, um, especially for, a young person like me who was struggling to imagine it and, and struggling to bridge the gap between past and present. So these personal letters for me turned the Civil War from that series of past events more into a giant story where there's many different narratives by many different narrators. Um, and all of those narr uh, narratives are interacting. And so that story I could really engage with. And from that point on, I became more curious about the secondary sources that I thought were dry before because I had this context, uh, you know, these 26 women who I understood. Um, so there are plenty of ways to get students involved with primary sources. Um, but I like to talk on the advantages of using document projects in particular. And there are advantages and benefits for the users, the people who look at our site, view our documents and read our project. Um, and there's also these benefits for the creators, people like Professor Plant and myself who work together to create these projects. But I'll start with the user benefits. Um, document projects allow educators and academics 
to access documents that would otherwise be unavailable online. So I don't think the letters that we publish in our projects are made available online anywhere else at this point. Um, when Professor Plant and her colleague Frances Clark found these letters about 10 years ago, uh, she told me they had, most of them had not been opened uh, since the 19th century. So our project is really allowing 26 voices to be heard online and to be used as a teaching tool after having been forgotten for over a hundred years. Uh, another benefit is that uh, we did the transcription work for you. So you don't have to navigate that really old fashioned handwriting, everything's there in, in print. But really the most important user benefit of a document project is that each project ties a set of primary source documents together thematically. So say you're teaching the Civil War and you want to teach on the topic of, you know, a typical Northern woman's life. You can search far and wide for different primary sources to cover your topic, but with a document project, we have a set of 26 sources published in one location, and we have researched the authors, you know, provided these contextual summaries for each document. Um, and we have an introduction that explains the relationship between these sources, the common themes among the authors, um, and the significance of these letters to Civil War history. So it's all in one place. If you want to teach this topic, we have the resources for you to do that. But really, um, through my experience, the best way to be using document projects is to be creating them. Uh, this is a really great opportunity for professors and students to get together and work on something together. Um, as a student, I learned not only about the Civil War, I did learn a ton about the Civil War, of course, but I also learned more generally how historical research is conducted. Um, I did transcriptions, I selected documents, I drafted introductions, I researched authors, you know, I'm giving a webinar now. So no matter what field I'm graduating in, uh, this project has been such a great experience for me on so many fronts. And of course, the, the benefit for educators is that um, if you want to publish a document project and you are collaborating with a student, um, you don't have to do all of the tedious work yourself. So working with Professor Plant, you know, she's an expert historical researcher. I know she, that she has done transcriptions herself, that she has drafted plenty of papers herself, um, but these are things that I hadn't done before. So it was very exciting for me to do these things for the first time. And at the same time, Professor Plant um, could sort of, you know, pass off some of her work to me. Um, and this is just a fun example of really how much work goes into publishing this kind of document project. So here's one of the letters that we were working with. Um, and it took us three people and a really long time to just decipher the header on this letter, just to transcribe those few lines of text. Um, and I know I spent at least 20 minutes trying to figure out what that one character was, um, whether it was an N or a P. Um, and I was happy to do it because these letters were so new to me. They were fun to look at, fun to decipher. Although Professor Plant, I'm sure, wouldn't want to spend her 20 minutes doing that same thing. Um, so that's all to say that you know, that professor-student collaboration with document projects, I can't recommend it more highly. Um, students will get experience in research and history um, and professors get to, you know, publish without doing all of that tedious work. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to you, Professor Plant. Great, thank you so much, Kayla. 
And as I'm sure you were all able to gather from Kayla's presentation, working with her just turned out to be a really wonderful experience. And for me personally, it was a great reminder of how energizing and inspiring students can be and how they can serve as a real impetus for us. So in terms of this particular example, you know, Francis and I, we would likely someday somehow have done something with these letters, um, but we certainly would not have a um, published document project today without Kayla, I can say that full stop. And, um, you know, who knows, given the multiple responsibilities we both juggle, that's Francis and I, um, it might have been just one of those projects that was infinitely deferred on our to-do list. It wasn't just a matter of getting us launched. Um, Kayla in many ways acted as the kind of project manager, reminding me of questions that I needed to discuss with Francis or calling my attention to issues that needed to be addressed. And just generally sort of turning my attention back to this during the midst of a really busy quarter when I was, as I say, juggling multiple things. So this brings me to my next point, which is just how important it is to give students responsibility. Of course, Kayla is an exceptional student, an exceptional undergraduate, but I think in general professors, we often sell our students short in terms of imagining what they're capable of doing when really motivated. So, you know, when we first began working together, I didn't intend to have Kayla do so much, but she just continually proved her competence. Um, it soon became clear that she could read and transcribe those handwritten documents, um, which a lot of our students cannot. Um, uh, and she did so with real precision, that she had a strong kind of intuitive sense of which letters would make for good primary sources to teach with, which ones would really um, speak to students, that she could identify larger historical questions at stake. Um, so, you know, the, the more she rose to meet the bar, the more responsibility I handed her. And I've been reminded of this in other contexts too. I've had students write biographical sketches for public history projects um, where they're going to be on a website. And when they know their work is going to be published, they just, you know, really step it up. Um, so uh, just in terms of mentoring, I had a great time mentoring Kayla as well. And that's in part just because I don't get to do it very often. And I work one-on-one -on -one with graduate students all the time. But aside from the honors students that I've mentored, I rarely get to know my undergraduates that well. Um, and now, you know, I've taught at UCSD for 20 years and I simply don't have that kind of insight about students' lives and perspectives that I did as a newer and a younger professor. So having this mentoring opportunity, it really was a very special thing to me. Um, we even drove up to Los Angeles together from San Diego to present at the annual luncheon that the Women and Social Movements um, database sponsors at the OAH, the Organization of American Historians meeting. And what stands out to me most about that weekend was just how proud I felt um, watching Kayla present on our document project, which she did beautifully with great stage presence and entirely without notes. <laughs> so um, in other words, it was both professionally and on a more personal level, just really a, a great experience. All right, so I wanna to turn to a more practical note at this point and just discuss how uh, teachers can best use our document project in the classroom. Um, professors who are teaching courses on the Civil War um, will likely have a week or two devoted to the home front where they may discuss not just uh, the subject of women's experience, but things like the wartime economy and both the Union and the Confederacy, mounting political dissent uh, as the war progressed, et cetera. Um, so our document project offers really excellent uh, ground level 
view of the, the realities that people were facing, um, that Northern households were facing. And in this sense, it's just a wonderful counterpoint to secondary scholarship on the Confederacy uh, by historian Stephanie McCurry, who was initially, um, she drew on similar petitions that were sent primarily to state governors in most people in the South still wrote to uh, state officials rather than so-called federal officials. That was a, you know, um, part of the fact that they were a less centralized uh, society. So although those letters are not now actually available, so you can't do, you can't sort of put ours next to theirs. Um, she quotes from the letters enough that students can really get a sense of um, what Confederate women's concerns were. So it's, a, it's easy to do a compare and contrast, I think. This is what I plan to do <laughs> when I next teach the class on the Civil War. So what were the similarities and differences in petitions uh, from Union and Confederate women? What did the contrast reveal about the very challenges facing the Union and Confederacy respectively? I think those questions can really be um, probed by using these primary sources. And as for women's history courses, the emphasis of course will be a little bit different. Um, here teachers will likely be considering what difference did the Civil War make in regard to women's progress toward equality. Um, and I always talk in this class about how a small but impassioned antebellum women's rights movement um, that had little to no presence in Southern states had gotten going by the 1840s um, and decided to suspend its activity during the war um, pretty unanimously with the sole exception of Susan B. Anthony who thought this was a terrible idea. <laughs> so uh, women's rights advocates, they instead poured all their energies into fighting for abolition and preserving the Union during the war years. And the hope was that there would be this huge shakeup after the war in which um, the formerly enslaved and women would attain suffrage and equal rights as citizens together. And now obviously that doesn't happen. And I think that reading these wartime letters um, from ordinary women can help to explain why. So having students examine just the really highly gendered ways in which most women viewed their relationships to husbands and children and the federal government for that matter, governing authorities in general, that that tells us really a great deal about how they understood their roles and responsibilities at the time. Moreover, by underscoring the kind of grinding day-to-day -day reality of their lives, uh, the letters will help students better grasp why most 19th century women, they just weren't capable of envisioning, let alone fighting for a, wor a world that was structured by the principle of sexual equality. You know, why was this not really even imaginable at the time? Okay, so, um, Another point I want to mention just briefly is that we have tried to provide enough material in the headnotes that accompany each individual letter to make the project really user-friendly um, for professors who want to emphasize particular themes. So you can read the headnotes, you know, figuring out what you want to teach without reading every single letter. So for instance, an uh, instructor could assign a group of letters written by mothers concerning enlisted sons those would highlight the extent to which 19th century mothers and especially widows depended on sons for labor and economic support. Another approach might be to assign a cluster of letters that focus on the hardships that rural women experienced um, and how much they really depended on male labor and how difficult that got um, as you know, the war just sapped male labor out of the countryside. Or they could focus on letters by younger women. We also have daughters and sisters in the collection. And you know, they end up playing a really important role in helping to sustain families as well. So, you know, taking a thematic approach, in other words, there's just many different angles that one could adopt. 
I'd also like to say a word about using the document project in courses of different sizes. So the material is appropriate, I believe, for large lecture courses or small seminars, but how professors would use the documents in those two contexts necessarily would differ somewhat. So for large lecture classes, it's probably important to provide some initial information and discussion questions in advance, which we do on the website. We have things, you know, discussion questions posted. Um, for seminars, there's some more options. You could have students read uh, letters aloud in classes and analyze them in depth, keeping in mind that the letters, like all sources, give us only a partial view of the situation. So, you know, how should we account for the fact that these petitioners, they want something, they want something concrete from the government. So does that affect their credibility as sources? If so, how? Those are the kinds of questions that could be addressed. Um, and, you know, in seminars, you could do everything from having students like write a research paper. Uh, you could have um, them focus just on this particular collection. You could pair it with other primary sources as well. Um, so that, you know, you could do a more in-depth assignment is what I'm suggesting. But regardless of the class size, um, I think the kinds of assignments that you can come up with, they can be both really straightforward, like document analyses or more creative assignments. So an assignment that I might try um, if I get to teach this material in a smaller course is to have students select a particular woman and then write a follow-up letter in her voice on the assumption that a month has passed and she still hasn't heard from the, <laughs> from the government. Um, so I think an assignment like that, that really compelled a student to try to enter into an individual woman's mindset and even adopt her way of expressing herself, her language, would allow them to imaginatively engage with the question of what it really meant to be an ordinary Northern woman during this you know, momentous national crisis. Okay, so with that, I am going to turn things back to Jody. Thank you so much, Professor Plant and Kayla. Just really, that is such an engaging presentation. So we're just so appreciative to um, gotten to have hear, hear that today. We have had several questions that have come in through the chat. So I'd love to take a chance to address some of those right now. Um, one of the questions I thought was so interesting that came in, I'd like to pose to first Rebecca and then to Samantha. Um, our attendee has said that one, and you did address this briefly, Kayla, in your presentation, but I'd like to dive into it just a little bit more. One of the problems for students working with primary sources, such as letters, is to decipher the writer's handwriting. Do you have any insights um, into resolving that problem? Were there tips or tricks that you passed on to Kayla, Rebecca, that, that maybe helped? Or And then also after she's finished, Sam, could you maybe give some insight on um, what ProQuest and Clarivate are doing in this realm? I did not really train Kayla at all. She was for her generation, shockingly good at this. <laughs> um, I, I have a son. In fact, the reason I'm here in um, San Luis Obispo is because I'm dropping my son off at college. And uh, his, uh, you know, he, I read him the letters that his grandparents sent him. So it's um, not a skill that everyone has. I can certainly relate to that. So um, yeah, I, I, um, I think it is something that, you know, just to show them what it's like, I, I do think that it would be useful to, as an exercise to, you know, put, um, to make it like a game, to put a letter up on the screen and to have people um, debate and, and discuss together to try to work it out as a class, that might be one way of doing it. But I'm sure Kayla has some things to say on this as well. Yeah, yeah. I I will say that I although I did a pretty decent job of deciphering each letter and each word, you can't in my experience with that handwriting, you cannot 
you cannot actually process what the author is saying while you're trying to decipher the handwriting. So for me, it was always just go letter by letter and try to figure out what they're physically writing and then come back to it and try to actually read the message. Um, so I think if students are really having trouble engaging with primary sources because they're like, well, I can't read this, um, if you could provide uh, a transcription or have them transcribe it before they actually analyze it, that makes all the difference. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, such a manual process there of investigation and uncovering. But Sam, could you speak to the work that ProQuest and Clarivate are doing in this mm -hmm. space? Yeah, absolutely. So at ProQuest, we have, you know, the History Vault, which includes large archives of historical collections uh, with a, a huge amount of handwritten text. Um, and as Kayla and Rebecca touched upon, it is a painstaking process to go in and manually tra transcribe uh, handwritten text. So it, it's unfortunately, we don't have scholars who can go in and do this at a large scale for us. However, um, in the History Vault, we have introduced a handwritten text recognition tool. And so this tool gives full text searchability to the handwritten materials in these collections. And this creates a stepping stone into those historical documents for students who are unfamiliar with handwritten text. It is also a valuable tool for students as they try to decipher these sometimes difficult to read materials. Um, and we have introduced HTR uh, currently in History Vault's Southern Life and African American History, uh, Plantation Records Part Four, and this coming in December, uh, the Plantation Records Part Three for the Bayer Archives. So we are hoping to uh, continue to do this across all of our uh, archival content, but of course it is a, you know, a process we're still working on. That's amazing to make this hard to decipher content so much more accessible for researchers. Um, another question that I'd like to pose, uh, Kayla, coming from specifically from a psychology background, how did working on this project impact your approach to this field of study? Yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, like I mentioned before, um, working on this project, the skills, these skills that I developed and honed in on, you know, the attention to detail, the project organization, even the public speaking, uh, speaking those skills go anywhere. So uh, I remember uh, I spoke at a conference uh, for to present this project. Um, and I was so nervous about speaking at this conference. And then a month later, I ended up giving a psychology lecture. So of course, um, those skills will take you anywhere, no matter what your major is. Um, but something, one of the connections I've been thinking about a lot between this history project and my study of psychology is what we call in social psychology, uh, the fundamental attribution error. And that's the idea that when we are looking at someone's behavior, we tend to attribute their behavior to the di their disposition, who that person is. And we tend to minimize um, the situational forces acting on that person. Um, so when someone does something, we assume it's because that's who that person is and not because of what's going on around them. And I think that this project um, really helped me understand that on a deeper level. Um, because like I said, I thought I had no connection with these humans from another time. Um, but when I read these letters, I realized the people are the same. You know, the people from the Civil War are not that different from the people I know now. It's their culture and their environment that uh, causes them to speak and behave and write differently. And, um, you know, that lesson's not just applicable to psychology too, that lesson can also take you anywhere. Is that, you know, you can understand anyone really when you come to understand their circumstances and what's really going on in their life. That's fascinating. Thank, thank you for that insight. I think we have time for one more question here. Um, 
Kayla, you mentioned that Professor Plant provided you with a folder of resources. How did you select the specific petitions that you included? Did you have a process in analyzing them and selecting the ones for this project? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I wanna say I was given a couple hundred letters. Um, some were full, some were partial. And we were looking for letters written by women, but my process was I read every single one of them and I took notes on who the author was and the basics of what they were going through. You know, were they mostly struggling with illness or were they mostly struggling with grief or with emotional problems or financial problems? Um, and through doing that, I kind of could recognize automatically after looking at so many letters, what was really typical for a woman in the North to be going through at that time um, and which circumstances were a little odd and not so representative. And then after having all those notes and hearing from all of those women, uh, we really just together, we weaned it down to the ones that we felt were the most representative of Mm -hmm. that giant pool that we began with. I so see. a lot of, yeah, a lot of note taking and a lot of just reading letters over and over to get the gist of what was going on in that population. Well, I can't wait to dive in and to see the work that you have done. This is it's so informative and so interesting. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our group in the chat. We encourage you to continue this discussion. We have provided our contact email addresses on the screen. Please do reach out to any of us today with follow-up questions that you may have. Today, Rebecca and Kayla really spoke to the essence of why faculty-driven projects like women's and social movement in the United States 1600 to 2000 are so vital for contemporary scholarship and the unique contributions that these projects make to the academic landscape. If you want to explore the work that they have done in this unique document project, or if you want to explore the related components of Women in Social Movement Library or the forthcoming ProQuest Women in Gender Studies collection, please do reach out to us by email or by telephone. We thank you again for joining us today and this concludes our presentation. Great, yeah, thank you so much, Jody. I'll just say thanks so much to Rebecca, Kayla, and Samantha for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to Jody for moderating the Q&A. And thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the webinar and hope to see you again in the near future on another session.